Uh, I am very, very privileged. Priv I am very privileged to be joined today by Terry Lochran, uh, or sorry, I should say Rear Admiral Terry Lochran of the Royal Navy, uh, also known as Big Tail by uh, by most of the Royal Navy. Um, and you are joining me today to uh, hopefully give us a bit of an insight into what a career in the Royal Navy might look like. Um, so could I could I be cheeky and ask what has been your journey from from day one to today? Well, yes, and it's a pleasure to talk about it, looking back on it. Um, um, the first thing was, why, well, why did I want to join the Navy? And, and the reason was I couldn't think of anything else to do. <laughs> uh, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I didn't want an office job. I wanted a job which had some challenge uh, and, and which satisfied my interests, which would have clues, uh, included uh, a lot of travel. Well, I want to do that. Sport. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and to make friends and to do it with friends. And so uh, um, if in fact people look at all on the television and you'll see the, the Royal Navy advertisements, there's a current one running, which is uh, says something like born in Chertsey. That's it. I, I wasn't, but it said born in Chertsey, made in the Royal Navy. And of course that's, uh, um, that, that is so true of what happened to me because it's formed me into the, into the sort of, bright cheeked, rather uh, young and brash uh, uh, student that I was. And um, and of course, it satisfies every every interest. Uh, you, you know, you can you can go into executive, you can do engineering of all sorts. You know, that's, uh, you know, mechanical, electrical warfare, uh, the rest of it. You can be a pilot, as I did eventually, you can be a submariner warfare, logistics, medical, you could even join as a vicar if, you, uh, uh, if, you're, that, if you're that way inclined. So it satisfies uh, all of those friends, all of those, all of those routines. But, uh, and there's many ways to join, uh, because you could join, um, uh, you know, as, uh, from another career. Uh, you, you, know, you could do that if you were a, 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 a doctor, a dentist, a lawyer, or something like that, you could come in. But in fact, I joined through the Royal Naval College at Dartmouth as a uh, uh, as a potential seaman officer, seaman executive, as they call it, and um, and I only joined for five years, and I stayed for thirty five. <laughs> I was enjoying it so much, and um, uh, you can imagine that was uh, you, you know thirty five years. That's a, that's a lot. Um, you can of course join direct uh, from university. Uh, but in fact, Dartmouth itself is is a is a form of university. It covers many uh, many disciplines uh, while you're there, um, and and you don't of course have to join as an officer. Uh, you can join through HMS Raleigh, um, uh, where you can uh, learn an apprenticeship, for example, and you can rise right to the uh, right to the. Uh, the, at a very young age, actually, uh, as an apprentice, artist, uh, uh, doing engineering sort of things, you get a lot of responsibility very early on. And then, of course, there is a route from there through to officer as well. So, uh, so there's a route for uh, for everyone um, as it suits them. Yeah. So the, I was going to say that it seems to be that it's it's not a case of uh, you, you join the Navy to jump on a ship and see the world. There's there's far more to it than than what kind of TV and film might might portray as as a classic Navy career. Yeah. Well, and you get early. I mean, the thing is, you get um, early experience. Uh, so, for example, when I'd only been in for three years and I was a sub lieutenant and I was the second in command of a fast patrol boat doing uh, which could do 51 knots. <laughs> uh, it had uh, it had a crew of 25, and as the second in command, you look after them, uh, yep. all, all of them. So it's very early responsibility in that regard. And in fact, the the navy is um, is copied by a lot of uh, businesses. Really, we uh, use different language, but um, we have a divisional system. So uh, a young officer will have say 25 people in his division, and uh, these are uh sailors drawn from all of the disciplines or in your particular part of ship or something like that and you're responsible for their welfare for their further education uh which is quite a lot to do if you're a, you know yeah. if you're only a 23 year old yourself <laughs> and, uh, but the real beauty of it is of course you've had training at, at dartmouth but the secret of it all of course is you you learn from those above you and those around you 
um, and, and you sort of grow into the job. And you might think after three years to be, you know, second in command of a uh, of a fast patrol boat is a bit of a responsibility. But but you're ready for it. Yeah. So, uh, you know, on you go. That um that actually brings me on really nicely into my next question is um during your career what qualifications kind of have you earned uh, either official or unofficial? Well, because I because I went the uh, the executive seaman route, uh, the first thing you've got to do is to get a badge of office, which in fact is to be uh, to get a bridge watchkeeping uh, ticket, and um, and that is uh, allows you to sort of take command on behalf of the captain on the bridge to make sure the ship and everyone in it is uh, is uh, is safe, yeah. and that's a huge responsibility. And uh, particularly when I went, I got my ticket in this in this uh, hundred foot patrol boat, and then I went to an aircraft carrier, <laughs> and, um, and and you know the sort of the captain looked a bit askance at me. Surely he can't. But in fact, the rules are pretty simple in rule of the road and uh, and all of that. So you can exit. I was successful at that, but I really got the flying bug at that point, mm-hmm. and so I then uh, I then decided to go the pilot route. And uh, and I had a variety of uh, pilot uh, pilot appointments, uh, most of them actually from um, uh, smaller helicopters or smaller ships flying at the back end. But because I was already qualified to to uh, con the ship as the officer of the watch, uh, yeah. I would I would do both. Which of course somebody was writing your report and saying, well, this is a, this chap's ambidextrous. I mean, there's That's nothing he can't, he can't do, uh, and uh, and so. I had a successful career as a pilot coming up, and uh, and you, um, if you've got ambition, of course, and you're driving buses, you know it's not long before you think, well, you know, I think I'd rather run the bus company. That's it. In fact, I became the I became a flying instructor. I commanded a uh, uh, I commanded a training squadron, and uh, from there, because it's stepping stones to the the top, um, I uh, I had command of a frigate. Then a destroyer, uh, then then second in command of uh, big ships, a cruiser, a landing ship, and then finally uh, in command of uh, of an aircraft carrier. Mm. And the interesting thing is, when you're right at the bottom, when you're junior, they send you to a ship in charge, and uh, you know practically nothing. You think <laughs> you discover you know just a little bit more than everyone else. <laughs> Some grizzly coxswain who's been there forever and. And he steers you. He steers you through it. Yeah. And yet, you, by the time you get to to command an aircraft carrier, they give you six experienced commanders to uh, to help you do it. <laughs> so you don't really need it. But if you take um, that 25 people in that fast patrol boat, then you go transition over 30 years to the carrier with uh, a, a complement of 1,100 people. That's a significant I, step up. Uh, it is, and particularly because actually I had a hundred women. That was quite early in, in my day. A hundred women at sea, and uh, your girls will be interested in this. Actually, these these terms of boys and girls, that's not pejorative, you know. People think they're politically correct, you know. But in fact, we address ourselves on board as boys and girls. Yeah. Because it's a happy quite a definition, really. Mm-hmm. And and the girls occupied every uh, every role. Uh, on board, from engineers to logistics to uh, meteorology to off of the off of the watch, and of course we have them now commanding uh, um, large ships, frigates. So, yeah. uh, so that was very satisfying to do the, to do that. But of course, in all of in all of this, um, I mustn't gloss over the fact that there are jobs you have to do in an office. Yes. Because, you know, the old saying that the pen is mightier than the sword <laughs> and uh, you, you wouldn't be able to wield that sword of of deterrence, which is what we're in it. You know, we yeah. talk about we talk about warfare and fighting. But if you get round to fighting, then actually deterrence has failed. Yes. So you've got to have that balanced approach. That's the government's approach. That's the approach of the, the, the services as well. So uh, um, you, you've you've got all of those skills in your in your toolkit as it were in fact by the time you get to the end you're you're no longer a warfare officer you are an um, ambassador and a diplomat uh, yes uh, else. and and representing representing the nation which is satisfying and you don't have to be an ad, get to admiral to do that you know everyone has 
their own uh, their own level of responsibility they want to take on, um, uh, commitment they want to give. Mm. Uh, and I should just make the point that you can step off. You can step off this treadmill at any time you like, uh, because you can move into civilian life where you've got all of the skills that they're looking for. Self-confidence, presence, leadership, yes. experience, QED. So that, that leads me very nicely as well onto, onto the next question, which is while working on board a ship, what uh, what kind of thing, other than the obvious, what, what is it that working on a ship with, say, up to 1,100 other people, what does it teach you? Well, it's all part of of a uh, of a team, being part of a team. <clears throat> and again, I have to give it to the perspective of the captain. But um, um, you go away at sea. You might be away for five months at uh, <clears throat> at a time, and, and therefore it's very important that you are part of a big family. Now, there's uh, everyone. We say we're all in the same boat. Well, we are. Uh, a simple <laughs> a simple uh, evidence is if. If you're in a hot climate and somebody leaves the doors open and the air conditioning doesn't work, we all get hot. Mm -hmm. you know, and it's the same. It's the same principle goes through. So, in order to run, in order to make sure everyone feels valued, is in fact valued, uh, is delegation. So, um, this is where you get responsibility at a very early stage. It gets delegated down. The captain can't do it all, and uh, and right at the bottom, there's going to be somebody there with a spanner making sure that the water runs and all the rest of it. And um, and when he comes to action, he's got an action station and he knows that if he doesn't his doesn't do his bit, then all the rest of them up the chain aren't yeah. going to do their bit either. And meanwhile, there's also somebody down there baking bread every day. <laughs> so of course, you wander around the ship and you can smell, oh, that break on. Dear, 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 dear. And you know we serve, we, we you, you know you're serving four, three or four hot meals a day, and uh, and uh, hungry youngsters have a method of going round. So uh, so yeah. with, with a crew of eleven hundred, you know I can still serve fifteen hundred meals at each meal. Not me personally, but, uh, but yes, but that's how. It goes. <clears throat> well, I guess that in itself is a, is another massive logistical kind of career path within within the navy as well, isn't it? It, it is indeed. It is indeed. Um, so, um, kind of moving, moving, kind of uh, sideways, I guess. Um, try not to sound negative, but I think it's always an interesting question to ask someone: is um, during your career, have you faced any kind of significant setbacks or uh, redirections, and how was it that you dealt with these at the time? Uh, setbacks. Um, <clears throat> well, actually, curiously, I, I, I was not given much choice at the beginning because I only joined for five years mm. and therefore um, uh, it was uh, less my choice of what I wanted to do more than Navy's choice and so they they put me into sub submarines okay people joke that, that, that it must have been a midget submarine because I'm a small chap you see and all the rest of it but I, I had been really enjoying the sport and I paid, played played um, uh, rugby for um, uh, you, you know for various levels in the Navy. And I, I did, in fact, get injured fighting, uh, playing against a Spanish team on a bullfighting pitch in uh, in La Linea, just away from uh, from Gibraltar. Mm -hmm. And um, so I joined the submarine course and the um, uh, the uh, and I was only 21 at that stage. And I actually went to sea in the submarines. It wasn't a lot of fun, I've got to say, because actually you were training in a World War II submarine and the, the water actually, you could see the water coming in through the... <laughs> through the <laughs> bit. But I was then sent for by the doctor, who I think had watched too much of that famous film Das Boat. Hmm. You know, which is, I'm sure a lot of a lot of the youngsters will have watched that about the uh, uh, about the U-boats. Yeah. Uh, he'd forgotten that the the nuclear age had dawned and and he said that i he wasn't prepared for me to be caught with my injury to my knee he wanted to be caught on the uh, upper deck when the captain shouted dive 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 <laughs> don't wander around on the upper deck anymore um so i was pretty miffed at this so um uh, i on my my supposedly gammy knee i walked up to the naval hospital and said what's the most challenging uh, <laughs> medical category and they said aviation. I said, I'll take it. <laughs> so, of course, instead of uh, instead of living my life below the water, 
you know, on recycled air. I lived it in the fresh air and the sunshine and the excitement of uh, yeah. and, and all of these things. You know, imagine who would give you a who would give you a, a, a first boat, a first patrol boat and pay the crew and pay the fuel and invite you to go and drive it. And it's the same with an airplane. Who'd give you a helicopter? You could go out and, uh, of course, you've got a job of work to do. But um, I think that was probably the biggest setback I had. But that set setback I managed to turn into an advantage. Absolutely, yeah. Completely reshaped the career and and yeah and everything. Um, fantastic. Thank you. Um, so my last couple of questions for you are kind of um, getting you to cast your eyes back, I guess, to to your time at school. Um, what was it that you enjoyed while at school uh, or didn't enjoy for that matter that kind of has helped you throughout your career or has been that kind of constant reminder throughout your career? Well, I did enjoy the sort of peripheral activities uh, and um, obviously the, the, the schooling and you have good teachers and not so good teachers. You've got some teachers absolutely still vivid in, in my memory mm -hmm. and often they were they were giving you a moral a moral message sort of in you, you know it's woven through the through the uh, through the lesson uh, yeah. is is what it what it would be um and um what was i um uh, tell me again the question i before i get um, one again that's right what did what was it you enjoyed at oh, school, right, you school. Carried through. Oh, cool. so so that was good but of course it, again it was that team it was team building that's what i think attra attracted me to uh, uh to a really identifiable group as opposed to having a desk in an office in a corner somewhere and we did the duke of edinburgh's award yeah and uh and of course it was i was one of the first we were one of the first uh duke of edinburgh's award boys we so even though we only got this to the silver award um we uh um we had them presented by the duke of edinburgh which was rather really? impressive yeah. But what I remember about that where I was at school in Plymouth and uh, the most attractive part of it all was the 50 mile hike over Dartmouth. That's what we liked. And we had a we had a mentor who was a policeman who said he could find us anywhere. on <laughs> And we said, oh, no, you won't. But in fact, uh, we'd be all settled down drinking beer illicitly. <laughs> when suddenly we'd hear the sound of his motorbike he had a cross-country motorbike on brum brum and he would arrive with us so uh so that was a very early and very happy uh memory but it wasn't the transition i made from there to uh to the navy was a very it was a very smooth one um i suppose the navy the navy didn't even come as a as a rude a rude shock it was good self-disciplined and uh, yeah. Uh, and and you had your whole career to look for. It was all exciting. It was exciting, and, uh, um, and why not be excited on the start of your career? Wonderful. Um, one final question for you. Um, I know we have some students at our school that are are interested in a route, uh, kind of down the Royal Navy or the Armed Forces in general. Um, what what piece of advice would you give to anybody considering a, a career along those paths? Well, um, to to gain entrance, of course. You have got to uh, you've got to pass an interview somewhere along the line, and uh, and the important thing to do is to have read into it well, to have studied what you're going into, and uh, and ask um, ask yourself well, Im imagine the questions that you're going to be asked uh, in order to prepare yourself for it. Um, uh, you obviously want to uh, uh, you you can actually do liaison. Uh, you know things you can join a uh, with a regiment or something like that be adopted by a regiment or get some hands-on experience um which is quite a it's quite a way to understand yeah. but, but interviews like this speak to people um i mean there's lots of uh, lots of service people are around who can uh, uh who you can talk to and of course their their experiences will be uh, will be so different i mean for example we used to uh, we when we old timers get together we say Oh, these new people, they don't have as much fun as we had. <laughs> but, you know, they, I mean, people have different fun. I mean, you know, we we didn't have uh, we didn't have emails. We didn't have Instagrams. We didn't have uh, all, all these other things. We didn't have the social dynamics uh, yeah. that, that you've got. And of course, a lot of things today really enhance that uh, that that friendship and sharing your experiences. And uh, yeah. Uh, 
Well, thank you, Terry. Thank you so, so much for uh, for joining me today. It's uh, it's been a real privilege to chat to you, and um, and I know that the uh, the response to this is going to be fantastic. Um, what I would love to be able to do in the future is invite you um, into the school. Fingers crossed. Once we're allowed to have uh, have visitors again, to uh, to come and speak to some of our students directly, I think that would be a lovely opportunity. Well, I'd love I'd love to do that. It's been it's been a pleasure talking to you, and uh, and I I hope the editing goes well. <laughs> Thank you very much. All the best. Terry. All right. Okay. Bye bye then.